Well, as you've heard, we are in the book of Proverbs, a wonderful, wonderful book that gives some great counsel and reminds us, like Grandma D said, that don't hide the respect, right? Let it shine for all to see. Um, what a great thing, what a great challenge to your golfing buddies that you're, you're reminding them, hey, let it shine, right? Don't be... That's awesome. Wow, that's so great. So overflow, if you didn't hear that, she told them about the verse and then gave them the reference so they could go home and look it up. And so five ladies went home and looked it up and called you and said, I looked it up. It's true. It's there. (laughs) That's awesome. Way to encourage other people to be in God's word. Wonderful. There's a classic proverb that when people think about the book of Proverbs, they probably, you might have thought this proverb here, and I want to look at this one this morning. It's Proverbs 1.7, and it says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Have you guys heard this proverb before? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. They're just going fooey with that. We, you know, let's just do what we want. But if we want to be people of understanding and wisdom, it's very clear that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of that. The reality is we all strive for knowledge, don't we? We just want to know more. We want to have wisdom. We want to be a kind of person who has wisdom and is full of knowledge. And it's really deeply embedded in mankind, the pursuit of understanding, the pursuit of knowledge. It's just something that we just want to know more about. We want to know the meaning of life, right? It's like the, the, the biggest question is, what is the meaning of life? Whether you're a person of faith or not, it seems like that's something that we're moved to. We want to know how things work. Have you guys ever seen that show, How It's Made? I love that show because it just starts with like, how is toilet paper made? And it goes like, well, you go to the forest, you chop down a tree, and it like starts all the process of like how it's made. It's just a cool thing. I don't know why I, I, toilet paper just, I don't, anyway. (laughs) Could have been a lot of things, Rex. I know. I don't know why you chose that. How it's made. How do things work? Um, how, sometimes we want to know how do we make things better. And in order to do that, we have to understand wh- how it functions so that we can understand how to make it better. We ask questions all the time because we're in search of, of more knowledge, of more understanding, of wisdom. We ask, why is the sky blue? We ask, how does gravity work? You know, after you trip, you go, how did that, why did I get hurt so bad? You know, why, why do we dream? We ask questions like that. Why do you dream? Why do cats purr? You know, you wonder that. Some people wonder why they exist. That's just so mean, you know? (laughs) What happens when I put aluminum foil in the microwave? We just wonder, like, what happens? We want answers, don't we? We want deep understanding. We want to be confident in our decisions. In order to be confident in our decisions, that means we have to be, have understanding and be wise about it so that when we move forward in that, we go, I know why I'm making this decision. I'm confident in it because of what I know and what I understand. We want to be people that have creative problem-solving skills full of knowledge so that we can be useful to our full potential wherever we work or wherever we live. We want to know We want to have wisdom. The book of Proverbs gives us great insight on this theme of of wisdom and understanding. And it points to the origin of wisdom and understanding. It points right to here is a foundation for wisdom if you want it, a foundation for understanding and for knowledge. And it's, it's in the Proverbs. King Solomon said it like this. It's a sure way to be wise and full of understanding. He said, do or do not. There is no try. No, wait, that's not King Solomon. I'm sorry, that was Yoda. I'm getting my, my <laughs> books confused here. That's, that was another wise creature <laughs> that never existed. Uh, sorry about that. It, look, here's what King Solomon said in the book of Proverbs. This is legit. This is Proverbs 9, the first part of verse 10. He says this, Fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Fear of the Lord is the foundation. Do we want to know how to have understanding, how to have wisdom? Where do we even start? And it starts with the fear of the Lord. That's where it starts. So here's what I want to do this morning. I want to talk about what does that foundation actually look like? 
What does it look like to fear the Lord in our lives? I'm not talking about how to get smarter. That's not, this isn't a sermon about how to get smarter or how to get more wiser. Okay, I know, that's not right. That's why I said it that way. Or how to be full of understanding. I'm talking about how do we build a foundation that King Solomon and many other scriptures in God's word say this is the beginning of knowledge and, and it's the fear of the Lord. How do we operate? What does the fear of the Lord look like in our lives? The first step towards wisdom is the fear of the Lord. So I'm just going to say this. It starts with God. It starts with the Lord. So what is the fear of the Lord? I want to give us this definition that, I've, that I bring to you this morning. It says this. To fear the Lord is to have an extravagant reverence for God that has a dramatic impact on the way we live our lives. Let me read that again. To fear the Lord is to have such an extravagant reverence for God that it dramatically impacts the way we live our lives. In other words, this is the start of everything in our lives. It's the fear of the Lord. Simply put, the fear of the Lord is in every way start with God. In every way start with God. Now I want us to explore a little bit more about what God's word talks about when it references these, these words, the fear of the Lord. This idea of having extravagant reverence for God in every part of our lives. If you are a note follower and you like to fill in the blanks in the back of your bulletin, you can follow along there. Number one, to fear the Lord is to obey him. To fear the Lord is to obey him. The psalmist, David, he knew this. And in Psalm 111, verse 10, this is the New Living Translation, he says this, fear of the Lord is the foundation of true wisdom. There it is again. And all who obey his commandments will what? Grow in wisdom and then praise him forever. All the attention goes to him. So to obey his commands, you'll grow in wisdom. Jesus reminds us of this, and he's quoted in the gospel saying, if you love me, Jesus said, you will keep my commands. If you love me, you'll keep my commands. So we understand that obedience to the Lord is important when we talk about building a foundation on fearing the Lord. We need to obey the Lord. We, if we want to have full wisdom and understanding, obedience to him is a must. Now, how do we know how to obey him? Well, we look to God's word. God's word gives us how to live the life that he has asked us to live. He has designed for us to live. And so we need the book of instruction, God's word, for us to continue to follow through. Have you ever put together a piece of Ikea furniture or a piece of furniture that you're like, this is a desk and it comes in a box this thin and this wide and it's supposed to build a desk. Have you ever built furniture like that? Okay. Um, young parents, have you ever built a dollhouse for Christmas Eve for your kid Christmas morning? Okay. You cannot accomplish this task without... The instructions. Don't skip it. Don't just go, what's this? Oh, there's two of those. I don't know. The book doesn't know anything. Let me just, you know. That desk will look like a Barbie doll house. <laughs> and the Barbie doll house will look like a boring desk. We need God's word in our lives to show us what it looks like to obey this life that he has given us. But here's the deal. Our focus of obedience must first be on our faith in him, not on what he asks us to do. Let me say that again. The focus of our obedience should rather first be on our faith, obeying God with our faith first before we obey him with a list of to do and not to do. That's so important. Because if you focus on, well, God says this, and so I got to do this, and God said don't do this, so I shouldn't do that, if that's our focus is just the list, you know what happens after time? We become legalistic, and we become rigid, and we lose the love behind the obedience if it's just a list. Remember what our greatest commandment is? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all of who you are. So focus your faith in the Lord first. How can your faith obey God. We're reminded out of Romans 10 that faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And so our focus must be on Christ. Our meditation must be on Christ. The delight of our soul must be on Christ. He has to be our focus it's to love him. Because when our focus of faith is on the Lord first and not on the lists, then it's out of love for God that we obey. 
It's out of love for Christ that flows a life of obedience because if we just go, well, I'm a Christian, that means I should just obey. And that's my first focus, obey, 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 obey. Yes, that's true, and it shows our love, but we have to know the God that we're obeying. I'll give you an example. If our dog needs out in the middle of the night, which happens very often, and my wife is alerted to the fact that the dog needs out in the middle of the night first, she might give me one of these as we're sleeping in bed and say, go let the dog out. Out has just a little bit more than the other ones. I'm not sure why. You know. Go let the dog out. Now, that's really inconvenient. I'm sleeping. I mean, of all times, to get up out of a dead sleep I don't want to let the dog out, but out of love for my wife. <laughs> I know what you guys are thinking. Happy wife, happy life. You know, that's not what I was going to say. Out of love for my wife, even if I don't want to, even if it's so inconvenient, I will get up and let the dog out because I love my wife and she asked me to, not because I love the dog. <laughs> okay? Now, I love my dogs. But I love my wife way more, and because I love her, I will do what she's asking. And it's out of that love that allows me to do something that even when it's inconvenient, even when right now I don't really want to, but love motivates me to say, I will do that. When we talk about obeying God, I want you not just to go to the list, do this, don't do that, but let our faith obey him first and say, Lord, I I want to learn to love you. I want to have a relationship with you where I can learn to trust you so that when you ask me to do something that I really don't want to do or that's really inconvenient right now, that I will do it because I know that I love you and that you love me. If we want to fear the Lord. It comes out of a root of love to the Lord, which then out of that flows obedience. To fear the Lord is to obey him. The second thing to fear the Lord is to submit to his discipline. To fear the Lord is to submit to his discipline. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 7 and 8. It says this, as you endure this divine discipline, we're going to come back to that first line, as you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who's never disciplined by his father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all his children, it means that you are illegitimate and you're not really his children, child at all. So let's talk about discipline. God disciplines us. He disciplines us because we are his children. Now, discipline means that we're going to be taught something. We're going to be corrected. We're going to be molded. As soon as you say yes to Jesus Christ in your life, this discipline begins. The Holy Spirit begins to show you things that you once did apart from Christ that is no longer a part of your life, and he shows you through God's word and through the testimony of others. The Holy Spirit reveals to you a new way, and that's God disciplining you. It's, it's correcting your course. Now, Sometimes God teaches us his way as a believer, in fact, he always is teaching us. That's what it looks like to be disciplined by the Lord. It's a, it's a teaching. It's a training. God will also correct us when we sin. It's a part of discipline. He says, that's not what I have for you. I'm correcting you, and I'm charting a new course. For you. I'm showing you this is the way I have for you. Sometimes God molds us as we grow. This is all God's discipline. It's all a matter of training us. That's how he trains us. He teaches us, he corrects us, he molds us. Now, how does God do that? How does God use discipline in our lives? Well, sometimes it comes through the form of suffering. When, we, when suffering comes in our lives, we sometimes automatically think, well, what did I, what, 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 is God mad at me that this suffering should happen? And I just can't wait to get out of this suffering. If I could just get to the end of this, everything will be fine. But actually, sometimes God is using that suffering, that brokenness, that moment where we realize our limitations because God is disciplining us and we need to pay attention to what God is trying to say. Sometimes he uses hardships. Like this really isn't fun right now. This is really inconvenient right now. I didn't need this. I have so many other things that I need to do, Lord. Why this? Why now? 
Sometimes he uses those hardships as a time to mold us. Because he says, I saw how you handled that situation and you weren't very patient. And so I'm going to bring this situation again to you so that I can teach you something, but I need your ears and your heart to be open to what it is I'm trying to show you. And submitting to his discipline is vital for our walk with him. Sometimes it comes in forms of loss. God will show us something when we lose something. Sometimes God uses blessings. And sometimes he uses waiting, which none of us really like to do at all. Sometimes it's in those moments of waiting that God shows us his discipline. You know what the author of Hebrews reminds us? He says this, as you endure this divine discipline. He uses a word there, as you endure this divine discipline. That, in other words, he's saying, as you submit to God's discipline, as you put yourself under the authority of God, as he disciplines you, you're going to endure that. You're going to see that this is a value. There's a couple reasons why we should submit to God's discipline or endure that divine discipline. Number one reason is we should submit to God the Father's discipline because it's an essential part of the Father-Son relationship. Because God loves you, as his child, he disciplines you. In fact, the writer of Hebrews goes, who ever heard of a dad not disciplining his kid? You know, now we see, unfortunately, what happens when a child has no discipline in their life. They, they just, it's unfortunate. It saddens my heart to see the behavior that flows out of that. And we've seen it before. And it's because of the lack of discipline. Not all the time. I'm not saying all the time, but we have seen an example of that. And so here's the deal. It shows the connection that our Father has because he loves us. He cares deeply about you, and so he brings discipline because he cares about you. A lot of times we have it backwards. Well, what? God doesn't like me, and so this, is, this discipline is happening right now. It's the other way around. A parent who doesn't care deeply doesn't put proper boundaries and guidelines in place for their kids to grow up healthy and mature. Let me give you an example. The kid says, hey, dad, hey, dad, hey, dad, it's the morning. Hey, dad, um, I want breakfast. Can I have chocolate cake every morning for breakfast, dad? Oh, sure, son, because I love you so much, you can have chocolate cake every morning for breakfast. Uh, there's, that's, there's something wrong there, isn't there? Does the dad really, is he thinking about the future for his son? Is he thinking about tooth decay and diabetes and all these other things, right, that come with chocolate cake for breakfast every single morning. In fact, if the father truly loves the son, he would say, son, I'm sorry, you can't have chocolate cake for breakfast every morning, just on Mondays. No, <laughs> no you need to have something that's going to help strengthen your bones and help you get out there on that day and keep your mind alert and, and help you. And you got to drink enough water. We need to help you grow as a young man. Why? Because you have the ability and capability, son, to be a strong young man and to be useful to the people around you. And if you eat chocolate cake every single morning for breakfast, you're going to be just a puddle of chocolate on the ground that uh, you're useless. You're just going to be, you know what I mean? Like it's not going to be good for you. Now, I know I'm being extreme in my example, but because the dad loves his son, he brings guidance, correction, and discipline. And that's why we should submit to God's discipline because it's a central part of the father-son relationship. The second reason that we should submit to God the father's discipline is because it's always beneficial. Always beneficial. His correction is perfect and always exactly what we need when we need it. Why? Because he knows best. Now, sometimes we ask for chocolate cake because we think that would be best. Right? And I'm using this symbolically as other things in our lives. And we think, well, this would be good because this would taste good right now. This would just kind of be like, yeah. But the Lord goes, no. See, what I have for you has way more benefits than just tasting good on the tongue right now, so to speak. 
You want the quick fix, the quick answer, but I'm bringing you to this season because I have something greater for you in store, and so submit to my discipline. Endure this. Recognize that I have your best interest in mind. See, we can't see what tomorrow holds. We can't see what God is at work now, a year from now. We don't know what that looks like, but he does know. And so when we submit ourselves to the Lord's discipline, we say, God, I trust you that your discipline always benefits my life and the believers around me, always, because I trust in you. You know, part of my relationship with God involves fearing him. It's a vital part of my relationship. It's a vital part of your relationship with God is to fear him. And I have to have a view of God as one who has authority in my life. That's very important for me. Because if I don't view God as authority in my life, then I can't endure the discipline under him. I just, I'll just go, no, you're not the boss of me. I'm going to go do whatever I want. But if I endure, if I stay in that relationship of father-son, then I recognize even though I don't like this, I know it's for the betterment because I give God authority. See, I don't think an unbeliever fears God. I don't think an unbeliever can fear God because they haven't come to a point in their lives where they see God as authority in their lives. And for the believer to say, Lord, I have the fear of the Lord in my life, that means say, Lord, I, you have authority and I will submit and I will endure what you bring my way because I know it's always beneficial and it's essential for our relationship. You know, really, this idea of submitting to discipline just boils down to trust, doesn't it? Am I trusting God fully with my life? Do I really trust him enough to give him full authority, and endure divine discipline. The third thing is this, to fear the Lord is to seek him. To fear the Lord is to seek him. Look at Isaiah 55, 6 through 7. He says, seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he is near. Let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that they may have mercy on them, that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to God, for he will forgive you generously. I love how he ends that, for he will forgive you generously. To fear the Lord is to seek the Lord. What is that? To seek the Lord is to continually move towards him. Continually move towards him. You will always find the Lord when you move towards him. He is not in hiding. When you feel like he is distant, seek after him. Move towards him. Find his promises in the word. Get in the word of God. Get on your knees in prayer. Get around other people who also model the fear of the Lord and seek after the Lord. Let the voice of the Lord be the loudest one in your heart and seek after him because he's never in hiding. I know in my life, God has always been faithful to show me what I need to see. God has always been faithful to show up when I seek after him. Now, here's the deal about that. Sometimes we go, Lord, just show up. Just show me what the answer is. Just come right now, and we just want to go snap my finger, and we want to see God just go poof right in front of us, and we just go, okay, I'm seeking. You're there. Yes. But we can't. He's not a genie in a lamp where we just cricket, cricket, cricket. Woof, what do you want? You know, that's not God. It's waiting on him. Be still and know that I am the Lord. And in my life, I've seen that when I get a little impatient, I recognize because I want something done my way, potentially, and I want an answer right now. But to seek the Lord is to continually move towards him, even when we don't feel like we get the answer that we're looking for or right away, keep seeking the Lord. Keep seeking the Lord. And most of the time, in my life at least, when I calm my heart down, And I allow God's word to renew my mind. And I wait patiently for the Lord. He shows up. Basically, our life, our heart, our mind needs to be saying, yes, Lord. I'm going to pursue you. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Seeking the Lord is to look at the Lord and say, yes, Lord, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to walk in your way. I'm going to say yes to you in the morning. I'm going to say yes to you even over here on the sidelines when I just don't feel like that. I'm going to say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, to seek after him. But there's another element of seeking the Lord. 
Seeking after the Lord and saying yes to him also means that we say no to sin. See, we can only face one direction. The question then for my life and for yours is which direction are we facing? What is, where is our allegiance? Which direction is our life going? Are we seeking the Lord and saying yes to him and saying no to sin? Or are we saying yes to sin and saying, no, sorry, Lord, I'm going to go this way. Proverbs is pretty clear on this. And I'm going to read for us on the screen, Proverbs 8, 13, and 16, 6. It says this, fear, to fear the Lord is to hate sin, is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior, and perverse speech. And then Proverbs 16, 6 says, Through love and faithfulness, sin is atoned for. Through the fear of the Lord, evil is avoided. So yes, to seek the Lord says yes to him, but it's also to say no to sin. It tells us that when you fear the Lord, you hate what the Lord hates, and that's sin. The Lord God does not want us to have anything to do with sin. He desires us for us to run away from sin. He wants us to rebuke it. He doesn't want us to just settle for it. He doesn't want even a hint of immorality in our lives. But here is the dilemma, is that we live in a world that's completely fine with sin. In fact, the world lives in tolerance to sin. The world doesn't hate sin. The world allows sin, is it okay with it? It, defines e- it redefines evil and allows sin to just be okay in the world's eyes. It's not the same thing as what the, what, what the Lord sees and what the Spirit wants for us. The ways of the world move away from the heart of God. They don't say yes to the Lord. They say yes to self. And so the world does not fear the Lord, and so it does not hate sin. God's plan for us is to have a pure and holy relationship with him where we say yes to him and no to the evil. And that's why Jesus prayed that we would be in this world but not of it. That we would see that although we live in this earthly body, that the Holy Spirit is in us and is moving us towards a relationship that honors and pleases him. And every time we take a step step towards yes, Jesus, we take a step away from the, the behavior of the world. Because sin creates distance from the relationship. This father-son relationship creates distance, and that's exactly why Jesus came. You see, we move towards the Lord, but it's not in our own accord. It's only by the grace of God, through the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, that we are able to live out the life that he has designed for us. We cannot do it on our own. It is fully the Holy Spirit's work in us to forgive us and cleanse us from sin and renew that relationship that God has. It's a beautiful thing. Paul in 2 Corinthians, this isn't on the screen, so uh, you can write this down and look at this, look for this later. We're gonna, I'm going to read to you out of 2 Corinthians chapter 6. But Paul quotes God to the church in Corinth, and he says this. God, he's reminding the people, God's people, of, of God's heart. He says, God says, quoting God, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. And I will be your father, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And then Paul says this in the first verse of chapter 7. Because we have these promises, and guys, these are great promises. Dear friends, let us Cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body and spirit. In other words, say no to that and say yes to the Lord. And then he says this, let us work towards complete holiness because we fear God. Because we fear God, we're going to continue to seek the Lord. Because without him in our lives, we're not able to say no. When we say yes to him, he gives us the ability to say no. Just do a a quick search on what does the Bible say about resisting temptation? Do that as as part of your homework. I went like this because I'm assuming you're going to Google it on a keyboard or like this, okay? How do you, what does the Bible say about resisting temptation? And it clearly says that God gives you a way out. God supplies the exit because when we say yes to him, he allows us to say no to the evil around us. It's the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. 
That's why I love when he says, man, guys, we have a promise in the Lord. And when we fear the Lord, we are seeking after him. Can I just encourage you to seek after the Lord with all of your heart and watch how the Lord continues to grow in you a life that models Jesus to the people around you and that grows that relationship that he's designed for you. Yes to him, no to sin. The fourth thing, what it means to fear the Lord, is to worship him. To fear the Lord is to worship him. Look at this Psalm 86, verse 9. It says this, All of the nations you made will come and bow before you, Lord. They will praise your holy name. Now, you guys are going to help me preach this one this morning, okay? I'm going to read the first part, and you guys, overflow included, read the underline like we mean it, okay? All the nations you made will come and bow before you, Lord. Come on. They will praise your holy name. When we worship the Lord, we worship him because we're basically highlighting the name of God. We're highlighting his character. We're basically taking the billboard and we're putting the Lord on it. We're putting characteristics of who he is, his name, who he is. We are honoring and worshiping him. He gets the credit. He gets the praise. He's the one that we are showing off. It is God. And when we fear the Lord, our life worships him. We just point to him in everything. That's what I love about testimony time. It's an act of worship. When we say, God, help me through this, we're pointing to him. Testimony should always point to him. It should never point to me. Well, I did this, and I did that, and I did this. Testimony means, I wasn't sure about this, or I didn't know how this was going to go, but God did, and he's the one that gets the credit for all he's done. And that's what we heard earlier today. I worship God because of who he is. We worship him who he is first, and then we watch what he does, and we give him extra credit for what he does because of who he is. It's so important for us to understand what that verse is saying is they will praise your holy name. The name of our Lord should be praised. In your life, what does that look like? What does that look like to give God praise? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you some names on the screen in just a moment. There's going to be a ton of names. They're all going to be different colors, characteristics of God, attributes of God, ways that God has shown up in your life, titles of God, titles of Jesus. And as we look at these names, I want you to find one that resonates with you. Luke, go ahead and give us these names up here. Just just look at this. I mean, there's a lot there. There's a lot to take in. I know. It's like, whoa. But just look through that for a moment. so much there. He's the beginning. He's a soul's joyful thing. He's our creator. He's our father eternal. He's our hope. He's holy. The way, the truth, and the life. He's our power, our refuge. We're going to leave that up here for a minute because I want you to find some attributes of God, some names of God, who he is, and I want you to deeply connect your heart to what that is, and there's probably more than one. And the reason you're connecting with that word or that word or that phrase is probably because of what you've gone through in your life and how God has shown up. Maybe you were far from God and he welcomed you home and so he is your loving father. Maybe you were in need and he provided and so he is Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. Maybe you were lost and now you're found and so he is your savior. He's the one that rescued you. Maybe you were hurting and he brought healing. Maybe you were alone and he was your comforter. Maybe you were confused and God was your truth. Maybe you were anxious And Jesus brought you peace. And so we deeply connect with who God is and we worship him. We say, God, you are amazing because you are truth in that confusion. 
Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to worship God with what you see in front of you. And there might be another name for God or an attribute of God that really means something for you this morning, and you want to share that with everybody. And so here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to scatter this. Your, your, and so just look for something up there or something in your heart, and I want you to give witness to that. I want you to worship God, a name of God, an attribute of God, and just say it out loud for everyone in this room to hear. And the camera might pick it up as well, and so somebody's going to be blessed later on, and they're going to do it as well. Overflow, I want you to just say it. Go ahead now, and in three seconds, and 10 seconds, but go ahead. Say it. Amen. Say it again. Amen. I want just the back half to say the word. Go ahead. Amen. The front. Go ahead. Praise the Lord. Overflow. Go ahead. Isn't our God good? He deserves all the credit, He deserves all the honor. And when we worship his holy name, we begin, we continue the fear of the Lord in our hearts. To say, Lord, you are all of this. You get all the credit. Lord, I couldn't, but you can. Lord, I need and you have. Lord, I'm lost, but you can be found. You know, worshiping God is making a really big deal of a really big God. And my heart for every one of us is that we worship God in every part of our lives. That every part of our lives points to our amazing Heavenly Father who has a wonderful plan for us that begins with salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. The beginning of wisdom and understanding is a fully surrendered life in the hands of a mighty God. And to fear the Lord is to obey him, to submit to his discipline, to seek after him, and to worship that amazing God. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes as we finish this morning? And I'm just going to ask that we just sit in this moment of worship and we just honor the Lord. We just say thank you, Lord, for who you are, for what you're doing. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I'm so grateful just even just this week how you've shown me, how you sustain me. Lord, thank you for reminding me that the things that I think I should have are not really what I should have, but Lord, you give me what I, what I need, not just what I want. Thank you for seeing me through the moments that I, I just wasn't sure how I could get through, Lord, thank you. I worship you. I praise you. I adore you. You are an awesome sustainer. Lord, thank you in my life for taking away shame. I praise you, Jesus. Thank you for giving me peace. Thank you for satisfying me, Lord. And may I always look to you. Before we finish this prayer, there, it's possible that there may be somebody here who doesn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And you know today that God is, is here and he's speaking to your heart. But you recognize that there is something that's keeping you from knowing God fully and it's sin in your life and it's, you've never come to, to a place where you have said, Lord, I want to know you Will you forgive me of my sin? I want to follow after you. I want to call on you as my Lord and my Savior of my life. And if you haven't made that decision, then today could be a day of salvation for you. And if that's for you, we want to pray for you this morning, and we're not going to embarrass you or, or, or anything, but we just want to know who we're praying for. And if you want to ask Jesus into your life this morning, I just ask that you just raise your hand so that we can, I can pray for you this morning. Amen. Anybody else? Amen. Amen. Anybody else just want to say, I want to call on the name of the Lord this morning for salvation? Some of you may be recommitting your life. You feel like you've been distant from him, and you're just saying, Lord, I'm coming home. I know that I need you in my life, and I thank you for that. Amen. Amen. Pursuit Church, there's, there's been several folks who have been raising their hand, and, and I know what's behind this is they want a heart that is seeking after the Lord and I want us to pray for them together as a, as a family of believers. Can we do that? And so let's just, 
there's nothing special about the words that I'm using. It's a prayer from your heart. I'm just going to give us some words to use. And so let's repeat this prayer out loud together. Repeat this. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for who you are. I worship you. I know you have a great plan for me. And it begins with saying yes to you. Forgive me of my sin. I desire to follow you. I want to live my life facing you. Help me to say yes to you and no to sin. Holy Spirit, help me today. Guide me again tomorrow and move me towards your purpose. Thank you for your love for me. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. We need to give God praise for what he's doing. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank the Lord. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace today. Amen. We love you guys so much. We'll see you here, there, or next Sunday. You are sent. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in to today's teaching at Pursuit Church. We pray that the teaching today will encourage your faith in Jesus Christ to draw you closer to him and give you a better understanding of his word. If there's a way that we can minister to you, pray for you, or encourage you in your faith, please reach out to us on our website, PursuitNazarene.org, and click on Connection Card. Also, you can share this video with others and encourage them. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.